Shark has grown in popularity since this song has come out. When you see all the dudes on the screen, you just kind of go. And so, I don't know, fortunate or unfortunate, maybe it gave it a little more popularity. Uh, but it's always uh, a fun uh, this time of year because of the joy that Christ brings us. Um, and as we think about Christmas and we sing these praises, you know, born is the king, rejoice in the day. It's that same idea we've been talking about all month is that Christ was born into a chaotic world uh, to bring peace in the middle of our chaos. And whether that was you know, 2,000 years ago or today in our, our own lives, he still brings peace into our chaos. And that's just all the more reason to praise him tonight uh, and every day of our lives. Uh, so let's let, let that joy and let that peace be the focus of our, our service tonight as we praise and as we worship our Savior. And let's go to him in prayer. Father God, we thank you for this day. We're so thankful that you've given us another opportunity to praise and worship you. And God, we'd never want to take advantage of or forget, take for granted the joy and the peace that you bring us. And so God, as we move through this last week until Christmas, and all the busyness uh, and maybe all the, the difficulties of planning uh, family events, especially this year, God, and all of our turmoil and all of our busyness, God, we pray that you calm our hearts and that you bring us peace. And God, just as you brought hope and peace to a world 2,000 years ago, I think we need peace and hope every bit as much right now. And so, God, as we praise and worship you, we pray that you work in our hearts, that you work through us to help us to be better followers of you. We pray this all in your son's precious and holy name. Amen.
Good evening. You know, everyone here has a different story, how their winding path has ended here at Pleasant View. Uh, For many of you, it's, this is your hometown. You've been here your whole life. For some of you, you're a charter member. But for others, Maybe it's your first night here, and you're all welcome. Um, I've lived in several different states, uh, five different states, and uh, eventually my dad came here as a professor at uh, Tri-State. And uh, I was a teacher, and that's what I did for a career. And uh, I met my wife here. Uh, I went to a little church that Jim knows very well, Salem Center Presbyterian Church, and uh, my wife and I got married there on uh, one April Fool's Day. We eloped, (laughs) and as she says, it was a joke ever since. (laughs) But our paths are different. But you know, as time has gone along, our paths are getting closer together, aren't they? We believe in Jesus. We believe in what he taught. He taught us to love one another, to treat each other kindly, to forgive those who trespass against us, and for us to realize that we're we're sinful being, and we cannot get to heaven by anything good that we do. We could give away all of our money to the greatest charity. We could bring people meals. We could say kind things. And yet, we're just not good enough, are we? So, how does our story become more like each other? We started differently, but we believe in Jesus, and we believe what he did, and we want to be with our loved ones forever, for those that have gone ahead For our little grandkids that are just starting. We're going to have a new little grandson here this next week. And uh, as parents and grandparents, you want to be together for eternity. So what did Jesus do so we could do that? He knew we were sinful. We can't get to heaven uh, with that sin. So he took our sins to the cross. He sacrificed himself in a, and you've seen the the passion of Christ, and you know, if you've seen that, how brutal that was, that he took those sins. And so that someday, if we're Christians, 
and uh, we repent, and we're baptized, and we say the good confession that we're going to be in heaven with him, with God, with our loved ones. And so at this time with communion, we're going to remember what Jesus did for us so that we can have the same ending, even though we've started differently. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much that on these different paths, we've all drawn closer and closer together as we've learned more about you. And we realize more and more what's important, how we live, how we treat others, and the love that you have for us, and the gift of eternal life. So, Lord, we're going to partake of the elements here in a minute. And uh, so those of you that uh, need to get the elements can let the, get those in the corners of the uh, sanctuary. Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. <clears throat> we'll pray for the offering. Lord, we know that everything we have is truly yours. The blessings that you give us each day, the finances that we have, the ability to work and earn uh, some compensation. So, Lord, at this time, let us be cheerful givers. Let us realize that there are needs far beyond our own. There are needs in our community, there are needs in our state and the country and the world. So, Lord, let us be generous. And, uh, Lord, we pray that we will use these gifts to your glory forever and ever. Amen. Just like give you a quick update, um, I received a text from Marla concerning the blood drive we had. I think she said there were 33 units that were given, and I'm um, very pleased with that. We've got another one coming up in February, even though that isn't spaced out, but if you weren't able to give in this last one, you can give in the one in February. Then we've got another one in April coming up, and we're going to continue to do as many as we can here to help out during this um, need that they have. So if you took part in it in any way, um, you're, it's greatly appreciated. Greatly appreciated. The night is still. The lights of Bethlehem have been extinguished. It's quiet in the stable. There's a young woman there with a very nervous husband. Pacing back and forth. Drawing water. Holding her hand. 
wiping the sweat off of her brow as he prays like he's never prayed before. But then the baby comes. It's through intense pain. Mary muffles her cries so that she doesn't awaken anyone else that might be close by. And through that pain is born a child. Mary's okay. The baby, the baby's perfect. And they settle down after things subside and try to capture a little bit of sleep. But then all of a sudden, Joseph is awakened by the stirring of some feet at the entrance to the stable. He thinks to himself, perhaps the innkeeper or someone else heard Mary's stifled cries and came to see if everything was okay. So he goes to the entrance of the stable and he doesn't find the innkeeper or one of the guests, but rather he finds a few rough, unkept shepherds. They smell like they've been with sheep. They kind of hang back rather awkwardly, waiting for an invitation by Joseph to come into the stable area. And finally, one of them speaks up and says, we've come to see the baby. There is a newborn baby here, isn't there? I know this is going to sound rather strange, rather far-fetched, but an angel told us to come here to see this baby. You can almost imagine a smile creeping over Joseph's face. And he says, far-fetched? No, not at all. Come on in. They feel quite at home in this stable. They sit down on some of the hay and stare with their eyes fixed on this newborn baby who's sleeping there quietly in Mary's arms. And then all of a sudden, one of the shepherds blurts out a question, a question that was on all their minds. After a few moments of silence, he finally says it. Well, what's the baby's name? What'd you name him? Now, a lot of couples agonize over naming a baby. Sometimes they take weeks to do it. I knew of a couple uh, that lived down in the South Milford area. They would wait for a number of weeks before they named their child, and they had quite a few kids because they wanted to see what the personality that the child was going to be before they gave that child a name. If I had done that, my son's name would have been Crybaby. But, uh, you know, we, we didn't do that. Um, Martin, you, you know, a lot of times you name a child after someone you look up to, a, a good friend, a family member, uh, something like that. Now, Martin has a name, Martin Dwayne Boer. He's named after my father, whose middle name was Martin. My mother's father, my grandpa, who I highly looked up to, whose last name was Martin. His first name was Delbert, and I wasn't going to hang that moniker on my kid. And then Duane, my middle name, so Martin's kind of named after three different individuals. Michelle bears Marcia's name. Her name is Marcia Michelle. She's always went by Michelle, and she signs her name M. Michelle, uh, but we named her Marcia Michelle. Now, there's a few names when you hear them, and I imagine you have some come to mind right now, that when you hear those names, you think, what in the world were those parents thinking when they hung that name on that kid? Uh, I went to the internet, and I looked up a few names. There are some actual names. Holly Wood. Sandy Beach. You remember a few years ago, if you watch a whole lot of sports, there was this family, this couple that named their son Espen. And they spelled it E-S-P-N. Uh, I thought to myself, that kid's probably never going to play sports. He'd probably be on the debate team or something like that. Um, one guy was named Mike Clear. He named a girl by the name of Crystal. Uh, I've, got, I've got a cousin. I, they may be watching this tomorrow. Um, her, she married a guy by the name of Rich John. Her name's Jill. So her name now is Jill John. The first time she got pregnant, I said you could, you, you could choose it, name it Pay. Porta. I came up with a whole lot of names. They used absolutely none of them whatsoever. Uh, when I was down in central Indiana preaching, Cindy's church, uh, while I was there, we went to House in Ohio to Camp Christian. And there was a minister uh, from over in Ohio, uh, and this was his name, Ivan Oder. Now, if you say that real slow, it sounds like you're almost apologizing. Ivan Oder, if you stop and think about that. So you wonder sometimes where in the world these names come from. Now, Cindy at the church there at Spartanburg, 
um, there were two Cindy's there, and, and they were always getting them confused. So the one girl, they called her Cindy, and because of Cindy's middle name, they just started calling her CJ. Uh, if anybody ever comes here from that church, they'll call her CJ. That's the name she goes by. Now, for Mary and Joseph, they didn't have to worry about that, did they? An angel took care of naming that son. Now, in the Old Testament, there's some 300 messianic prophecies, detailed descriptions that acquaint us with who the Messiah would be, how he would live, and what he would accomplish. And 700 years before the birth of Christ in Isaiah chapter 7, we find the first time where a name was given to this Messiah. It's recorded for us again in Acts chapter 1, verse 22 and 23. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord has said to the prophets. A virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Emmanuel, God with us. Think about what that means. Not just God creating us, not just God watching us from a distance, not just God listening to our prayers, but Emmanuel, God with us working beside us, breathing our air, walking our streets, facing all the same challenges that we do every day. And Scripture tells us, Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So Jesus gives us a portrait of God. In John chapter 1, verse 1, you remember the Bible said, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then down in verse 14, it says, the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. So God allowed his son to come to earth to literally rub shoulders with us. God in the flesh, Emmanuel, God with us. You may have heard of prison fellowship ministry. They had a ministry very special at Christmas time, and it was called Angel Tree. And in this program, they got gifts for kids whose parents were incarcerated to make sure they would still have Christmas. Chuck Colson was the one who began this ministry. He was the founder of this prison ministry. And he was telling at a time several years ago when he was delivering angel tree gifts around Christmas time. He was in the Washington, D.C. area. And he came into the projects to deliver some gifts to different kids there. And he said, I went up to this one door and I knocked on it very lightly because it was literally just hanging there by one hinge. And I thought if I knocked on it very hard, the door may fall off of that one hinge. When he went to the home, he saw this steam heat radiator uh, clanging about as loud as a noisy car trying to heat this little apartment. And the kids were there. There were some older ones uh, because mom was away working and dad was in prison. Well, he told them who he was. and He had gifts for him. And one little boy looked up and he said, well, what's your name? He said, well, my name's Chuck. He said, what's your name? He said, my name's Emmanuel. Charles Colson said, I looked at him and he said, do you know what that name means? He said, no, I don't. So he got down on one knee, uh, reached in his back pocket, pulled out his New Testament and turned to Matthew chapter one. He said, look here, the Bible says Emmanuel means God with us. And he said, about that time, the boy's mother walked in and he excitedly said, guess what, mom? God is with us. Now, he said after he left that apartment and, and walked out into the street, It was snowing, and he said as he walked away, he kept hearing that little boy saying, God is with us. And he said, that reminded me that that is the hope of the world, Emmanuel, God with us. But we know there was a second name that was given to that baby, which was more personal. Uh, It was given by God to Joseph through an angel who said in Matthew chapter 1, verses 20 and 21, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. So what did Joseph do? He did exactly what the angel told him to do. Verse 25 tells us he gave him the name Jesus. Now stop and think about that. That would be the name that His parents would call him when they were calling him into dinner or to do the chores or getting ready to go to the synagogue. Jesus would be the name that a blind man would call out in that crowded marketplace because he wanted an audience with a great physician, that he might be healed with a word from the lips or the touch of the hand of Jesus. Now, that name Jesus would be the name that he would go by, but God chose that name. Why? God chose the name Jesus because of what it means. It literally means the Lord saves. 
Then some 33 years later, right after Christ's resurrection, in the opening chapter of the book of Acts, where we read the Apostle Peter preaching in Acts 4.12, it says, Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name given under heaven to man which we must be saved. What was it that that angel said? You will call him na- his name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. You see, God selected the perfect name for his perfect son so that the imperfect people could fall in love with Jesus. And when they fell in love with him and were obedient to him and lived for him, they would have the hope of eternal life made possible through his perfect sacrifice. You see, the rest of Jesus' life and ministry bore out the truthfulness of that statement, the Lord saves. Now, if you watch television and sports and stuff like that, or a lot of times just in personal conversations with people, you hear people talking about God, they talk, talk about the, the man upstairs and, uh, and other acronyms and things like that for God. But there's something very personal when you say the name Jesus. Now, Emmanuel described his nature, that God would be with us. He would give us a portrait of God. But the name Jesus described his purpose, to come and to seek and to save that which was lost. The orchestration of a baby being born of a virgin in Bethlehem was engineered by God himself, and he would have done that if there was only one person on the face of the earth that needed salvation. And that's the story of Christmas. That's what took place on that first Christmas when God left heaven came to earth to dwell with us so that we would have a means of redemption, a means of salvation to enter in again before his throne. Have you ever been mistaken uh, for someone else? I remember a number of years ago when my grandfather, Grandpa Martin, the one that Martin's um, named after, we had his funeral there at the little Whitewater Christian Church. And I've got a cousin that lives in Florida. I've been trying to go and see him since last spring. And I just called him today and said, not coming next month like we thought about maybe doing because of all that's going on. But anyway, um, when we're apart, I don't think we look uh, together. I don't think we look anything alike. But apart, people get us mistaken all the time. And um, I don't know if it's a compliment to me or, or, or what, because Bob is probably 80, 81 So I don't know if I really, really look bad or Bob looks really, really good. I don't know which. I'll take it that Bob looks really, really good. But we were, I was out there in the parking lot and this older guy that I didn't know came up talking to me. I was probably in my 40s then. And he went on and on and on and finally looked at me and says, Bob, you don't know who in the world I am, do you? I says, nope. And you don't know who in the world I am either because I'm not Bob. I'm Michael. Bob's in the church, you know. Uh, When I used to run a whole lot and... um, uh, If you can imagine, uh, I weighed about 50 pounds less than I do right now. I was pretty much a stick. And I went back down to Johnson, and Dr. Dave Reese, who, good friend of mine, just passed away here not too long ago. Um, But I saw his wife, and we were talking, and and here he came around the corner. And I said, Dave, how you doing? He kind of looked at me with that puzzled look on his face, because he hadn't seen me after I started losing all that weight and running a lot. And he said, "Uh, I'm sorry. Who are you? I said, Michael Brewer. We played basketball together in college. He said, no, you're not. I said, yeah, I am. He said, no, you're not Michael Brewer. I know what he looks like. You can't pull my leg. I got my driver's license out. And I had to show it to him before he would believe who I was. Now, this evening, I know most of you here tonight are here because of your relationship to the Lord and your love for this church, as Scott was talking about. Uh, tomorrow it may be a little bit different and there may be people watching and we're taping tonight in case something messes up tomorrow and they can show it but for whatever reason you're either here tonight or watching um, on the internet um, ask yourself what does Christmas really mean to you Um, a lot of people come to a church service Uh, unfortunately we're not going to have our Ken Light communion service this year Um, we're going to have it virtual rather than live here at the church And a lot of times, that's about the only time some people ever even come to church. Is it a candlelight communion service or a Christmas service or an Easter service? I remember growing up in Little Whitewater Christian Church. I was in high school. I thought it was funny. My mom was really ticked off about it. But Les Williams, who went to be with the Lord many, many years ago, he was the elder that day up on the pulpit. 
and it was Easter Sunday. And um, when he got done with announcements and stuff like that, he said, oh, by the way, I want to wish everybody a Merry Christmas. And he paused, and he said, because I know most of you won't be back again until Christmas Sunday, you know, and that's the way it used to be. I thought it was very apropos. But sometimes we come on those special Sundays simply because it's tradition. We all go as a family and stuff like that. And, and no matter why anybody comes to church, I'm always glad to see someone here. But I hope as we're gone through this series in the last few weeks, and as we're looking at Jesus, a portrait of God tonight, you realize that this is a whole lot more than just a holiday tradition. Uh, deep down, you need to make sure you have a personal identity with the one that we call Jesus. God called him Emmanuel, God with us, a portrait of God. And then his given name, so to speak, was Jesus, because the Lord saves. You know, it's important when we come to Christmas time and, and we listen to the Christmas story and I know some have the tradition of when they gather together as a family and again, that's going to be so different this year. Uh, you read the Christmas story together. Uh, one of the traditions that my wife had for years and years and years, she would always make a birthday cake and she had the nativity scene on the birthday cake and we would always sing with the kids and then the grandkids when they were young, happy birthday to Jesus. You know, whatever you do, don't mistake the fact of what this is really all about. The Bible says, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. Jesus isn't some historical figure. He's not someone we just traditionally gather together to worship now and then. James Irwin, astronaut, put it like this. He said, there's one thing better than man walking on the moon. He said, that's God walking on the earth. That's what took place on that first Christmas. Emmanuel, God with us. His son, Jesus, the Lord saves. We need to grasp that and hold on to that and share that with others. Shall we pray? Father, we do thank you for that which this time of the year means to us. For those of us that know you as Lord and Savior, we understand the fact that, to the best of our knowledge, you came here and, and, and dwelt with us, and that you died on the cross, that we might have the opportunity, the privilege of being your children. I know with all this going on and I recognize that so many just laugh at what we believe and the commitment we make to you and to a local congregation. But I believe now more so than ever, we need to be standing firm in our faith. We need to be sharing your love that you have for us with those around us that they might find the hope that we have through your son, Jesus. When we think of his name, may we remember it means God with us, the Lord saves. And Father, we thank you for that so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey!
Good to see everybody out tonight, and don't forget on Christmas Eve at six o'clock we will be showing the um, Christmas Eve service. Uh, Stephen's finishing up the uh, ra- uh, final touches on that. Um, also, I want to add on the prayer list. Uh, my daughter, I got a text from her uh, right here before I got to church that she was in um, ready care, not feeling good at all, and I have not been around her for at least ten days, if not two weeks. It's just been our paths haven't crossed. Uh, but she said she's really feeling horrible and she has been diagnosed with a COVID. Don't know if she'll be going to the hospital or anything like that. Um, uh, she's going to let me know later on. So be in prayer for my daughter, Michelle. I appreciate that. Have a great evening. Thanks for being here. Mm-hmm.